What's up everybody, David Rodriguez here, Stomped, and in today's video we're going to be doing a book dissection over The Carnivore Code by Paul Saladino, MD. And what this is going to entail is that this book is divided into multiple sections, talking about the carnivore diet and how he believes that Paul Saladino believes eating nose to tail is going to provide humans with the resources and the nutrients to be able to live their most healthiest life, or as he likes to call it, a radical lifestyle. Now, this book is very heavily referenced, so I won't be going over every single reference journal article. I'm just going to be picking out the things that where he makes his arguments about the whether plants are toxic to humans. So I'm not really going to be going over things where it's supposed to be like scientific facts, such as he says, Eskimos eat a, a primarily animal source foods diet, and then he references, well, it's like, well, yes, everybody, most people know that, and that's not something that needs to necessarily be debated. But instead, we're just going to be looking at his arguments on whether or not eating a nose-to-tail carnivore diet is actually going to lead you to living your best and healthiest life. So, without further ado, uh, I will link all the articles and everything that I can find that I've gone over. I will reference them here in the video and I will also reference them in the description. And you can also follow along if you have this book and you can tell me maybe things that I've missed or maybe things that I probably maybe cherry picked too much. I'd love to have a discussion over this book. Um, the actual book itself is great, is fine. Again, very well referenced. It's not just him just saying a whole bunch of stuff and just saying that, hey, carnivore diet is the best, no to tell carnivore diet is the best, period, whatever. There's actual references, actual science behind it. And so, but I've also been to college before and I know when I've also like found a journal article and I cherry picked a section of the article, even though the rest of the article might have said something that was contrary to what I had found. So I just kind of wanted to look into that and see, are these, uh, journal articles really supporting his claims or is it just a whole bunch of baloney where you can look at other things and say well yeah you probably can't really say that so let's go ahead and we'll dive into this first section so in the first section of this book he taught it's mostly anthropological just talking about human history and how he believes that even though humans have ate both plant and animal foods it's the switch to animal foods that have allowed us to become the humans that we are today due to the more like calorically and nutrient availability found in animal foods as opposed to plant foods. And so he describes this on page six in the carnivore code. He has a graph showing the span of brain size between primate ancestors all the way up to current humans today and it goes up and then there's a small drop off to where we are now as humans and his hypothesis is that once we start eating animal foods that's what causes the explosion in brain size and then once we figured out how to do things like agriculture and we started eating more plants that's what caused to our decline in brain size to where we are now <clears throat> Excuse me. So he brings us up in the first article called The Critical Role Played by Animal Source Foods in Human Evolution from by Catherine Milton from UC Berkeley, which states that without routine where he uses without routine access to animal source foods, it is highly unlikely that evolving humans could have achieved their unusually large and complex brain while simultaneously continuing or continuing their evolutionary trajectory as large, active, and highly social primates. So again, he's just using this as his, I guess his basis for saying that eating animal foods has led us to be the humans that we are today. And so when we look at what the journal, when I went, went through and kind of looked at what the whole journal article says, there doesn't seem to be anything that specifically contradicts him 
says using and one thing it says using animal matter primarily to satisfy requirements for essential nutrients other than energy and plant sources primarily for energy is a dietary strategy compatible with hominoid gut anatomy and digestive kinetics which actually that does uh, contradict what he uh, is talking about whereas we're using animal source foods mostly for the nutrients so things that you can't find in plants like B12, carnosine, taurine, uh, carnosine, e DHA, those things that obviously we couldn't, millions and millions of years ago, you couldn't find a fortified plant that had all these things in here that animal foods do. So, and then in the second part that I found that was interesting, it said that once animal foods had entered the human diet as a dependable staple. So once we kind of figured out how to start hunting animals and eating them and we were able to eat the eat animal foods with more regularity, we were actually able to branch out into different kinds of plants, into different kinds of the like, uh, cyanogenic plant foods. So plant foods that are not necessarily super good for us, but can provide energy and that, as, and that also, as long as we have animal source foods in our diet, we can use the compounds in the animal source foods to clear out the toxic plant substances that were within the different kinds of plants that we had found that we were able to branch out into and eat. So on this one, there doesn't really seem to be anything that is contradictory. Again, we can also use this though as saying that, well, we don't always just have to eat uh, carnivore diet we can also again continue to branch out as long as we have animal source foods that can help us clear out all the toxicity from the plants now we will go ahead move on to the next one where he talks about so there was not only so obviously we have human ancestors but we've also have branches where we possibly could have gone and we're talking about uh, Australopithecus afarensis, or I think also Australopithecus africanus. And then we're also talking about another potential, but they've died out, Paranthropus. And the problem was, is that Paranthropus went extinct because they favored plant foods. So on page seven, he quotes that, uh, a shift that, or so let's say, studies comparing ratios of these elements suggest that while Australopithecus ate a mix of plant and animal foods, the diet of Homo habilis consisted of significantly more plant foods. A shift that coincides with the rapid growth of the brain observed at this time in our history. Paranthropus, on the other hand, appeared to have relied more heavily on plant foods, a preference that was likely its undoing. So that one kind of makes it seem like because Paranthropus only ate plant foods that there is potential like a harm behind it. But when I looked at the actual journal article where he referenced this and used this in evidence for dietary change but not landscape use in South African early hominins by Balter, they show that it's actually, it probably, even though eating plant foods was its undoing, it was only because of the shifting landscape. So it wasn't because they were eating plant, it's not so, how do I word it? So it's not that because they were eating plant foods that they went extinct, it was because of the shifting landscape that made plant foods scarce, that they didn't adapt and therefore they died off and went extinct as opposed to Habilis and Australopithecus who had a mix of animal and plant foods and once the shifting landscape happened there wasn't as many plant foods then they were able to turn their attention to animal foods and that allowed them to continue to live while Paranthropus couldn't make the adaptation and went extinct so it wasn't necessarily because they only ate plant foods that they went extinct because if that was the case, then any vegetarian or any vegetarian animal who's primarily only herbivorous, 
then it probably also wouldn't exist. But it's not because they were eating plants. It's just because of the shifting landscape that caused them to have to force them to adapt. They didn't adapt and they died. The next thing we're going to talk about is called the expensive tissue hypothesis. So if you notice that in all of our cousins, so chimpanzees, gorillas, all the apes for the most part, and going back in time for our own human ancestors, you will notice that like a lot of them have enlarged guts and smaller brains. The thing is, is that both the whole entire digestive system and the brain and the nervous system require massive amounts of calories in order to function properly. Which is why gorillas need to be eating almost like, this isn't an actual scientific fact that I know of, but they eat well almost like over half their body weight in food. And humans can't really do that. If humans do that, we would kind of like throw up vomit and die. Probably. And so, but humans, on the contrary, we have larger brains and smaller, flatter rib cages. We also have tinier stomachs and, tiny, and a tinier digestive system in comparison to our cousins. And so, what, so why is that? And we know that evolutionarily, probably an increase in calories was going to be a no go just because of how sparse the land was, we, there has to be, a trade-off has to be made somewhere, which is where the expensive tissue hypothesis comes in. And so, it essentially goes that once humans had started to eat animal source foods that are more calorically rich as opposed to plant foods, we were, and because meat takes a lot less to digest, takes a lot less energy to digest than plant foods because with plant foods again with cows with gorillas with all mostly herbivorous animals they when they eat they have to continuously make it go through their stomachs so cows obviously have four stomachs to digest all the grass that they eat gorillas all herbivorous animals tend to have very again large digestive systems in order to ferment the food to make sure that you are extracting as much nutrients as possible from it and then that it's not just going in one end and out the other. And so he brings this up and on page 13, talking about the energetic trade-off between brains and intestines. And he references the he references an article. Brains and Guts in Human Evolution, the Expensive Tissue Hypothesis by Aiello, sorry if I butcher that name. And so, in this one, nothing seems to be off. Everything seems to be pretty comparable to what he has written in the book. Uh, reading through the article was actually pretty interesting because they highlighted they had a, their own graph in the journal article showing how organs are the most metabolically expensive organs that we have. So meaning that they take up the most amount of calories in order to function. So they had a graph and you were shown, I believe it was brains, heart, lungs, kidneys, and the digestive organs. And only the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys, the urinary system, all stayed the same, were the same across the board for both humans and human ancestors as opposed to um, apes and our like way farther back ancestors. Now the biggest difference was brain size and digestive system size. So when you look at the graph, for humans, we had a much bigger brain size compared to our guts. And the opposite was true for the ancestors, for our ancestors farther back ancestors. They had much larger guts in comparison to much smaller brain sizes. And 
And so it even talks about like the combined mass of the metabolically expensive tissues so organs, things like that for a human adult is very close to an average primate for a human body size. And that every, again, so like I just said, everything was about the same as far as kidneys, heart, lungs, all that stayed the same. The biggest difference was between brain and brain and digestive system. So the smaller di the digestive system allowed for a bigger brain because we were able to eat more calorically dense animal sourced foods. It appears to be the hypothesis or it appears to be what seems to work out and make sense. Now on page 14, we talk, so again, we talk about, so this ties into the metabol or the expensive tissue hypothesis because it's also believed that not only or it wasn't maybe it wasn't plant food or not sorry not plant foods maybe it wasn't animal foods that allowed us to eat uh be uh have a food source that was so calorically dense instead it was probably tubers so things like uh, i believe like radishes potatoes um anything that's basically grown in the ground that gives you like a lot of calories like all the the root vegetables and so on page 13, he says that um, there appears to be two problems, saying that humans didn't have to appear to be using fire until 1.5 million years ago, years after the sharp change in cranial vault size, my bad. And in order for tubers to provide accessible carbohydrates and calories, they must be cooked. Now, he doesn't make a specific, he doesn't have a specific reference for that passage, but he brings up that so in humans we have what's called the amylase gene and what the amylase gene is is that maybe you've probably heard this in like high school science or biology that when we digestion doesn't start here in the stomach it actually starts in the mouth so our saliva has enzymes that break down food that make it more readily digestible because you can't just like you can obviously just shove like a whole food into your stomach but it's a lot easier for us to digest and a lot easier to get the nutrients if it's first kind of mashed ground up which is why we have teeth and our saliva kind of mixes all up and that starts breaking down the proteins and the bonds that are within that food to make it more accessible and digestible so we can get the most out of what we're eating now <clears throat> what he brings up is that we have so Aside from our specific uh, human ancestors, there's also, we have Neanderthals and Denisovans who, all, who coexisted with our human ancestors and we, and human, our human ancestors have intermingled and like mixed together with Neanderthals and Denisovans. And if you don't believe me, it's true because in Europe, like point, Instead of, so typically I believe it's like we almost have like 0 0.0, like 1% of Neanderthal DNA in all humans across the board. But in Europe, it's almost like there are 0.1% of Neanderthals. So that's a huge increase. So it shows that Neanderthals, Denisovans, and our specific human ancestors have all probably intermingled at one point. And so he likes to bring up that Neanderthals and Denisovans did not possess the same amylase gene duplications like our homo, sa homo sapien ancestors did. And so he is using this that he says, quote, um, we also don't know exactly when the amylase gene duplication phenomenon occurred in our history, but the fact that Neanderthals nor Denisovans possessed these duplications strongly suggests that up until at least 600,000 years ago, our ancestors were probably not eating many starchy foods. If they had been, we would likely have observed this gene duplication earlier in human history. And so he brings up insights. So the journal article he references for this is Insights into hominin phenotypic and dietary evolution from ancient DNA sequence data by Perry G. H. <clears throat> and so the article says is that so even though he is not necessarily um, 
wrong about calories not being as accessible if they're not cooked. The problem becomes is that it's not that they weren't eating. So he says he probably, he covers his tracks. Says probably not eating, but we can't make that assumption because just because they don't have the gene for it, they probably could have been eating these starchy foods. They just didn't have the amylase gene for it. And so they probably would have gotten a reduced amount of calories that would have been significant for them. So it wasn't that they, the Denisovans and Neanderthals weren't at all eating tubers. They probably, the, the thing is you can't say whether they were or they weren't. Because if they were eating it, they just weren't getting as much benefit out of it as if you did have the amylase gene like our homo sapien ancestors did. And I guess you can put that as a, another score for the carnivore diet, saying that, see, because you don't have the amylase gene, you're not getting as much out of the tubers as you usually would. But I think the way that he's phrased it and saying that they probably weren't, as opposed to just trying to like sweep plant eating underneath the rug is a little bit disingenuous. And I think that it is, again, we can't say for sure that they weren't eating. He says, probably not. Well, that's that statement is probably not true. Um, again, uh, so again, let me bring this up where it says, we can only conclude, so this is from the journal article that he references, we can only conclude that if early hominins were consuming large quantity of starchy foods as hypothesized, then they were likely doing so without the digestive benefits of increased salivary amylase production. So again, this is in the own article that he referenced, saying that they didn't, so he was right in saying that they didn't have the gene, but I believe he's wrong in saying that they probably weren't eating these foods. So now we move on to chapter two of the book. Um, and the first thing that he brings up is a article, not a journal article, but an actual, I guess like um, an article that was written in the, it was written by Discover Magazine by Jared Diamond named the worst mistake in the history of the human race. And the biggest thing that comes is with the adoption of agriculture, right? So once we kind of like figured out how to start farming, that we kind of gave up the hunter gatherer lifestyle, obviously for convenience, because who wants to go out and try and track down an animal and then you may or may not be successful when you can like shove a root into the ground and then hey look there was like and then like a couple weeks later hey man there's like 10 more roots and we can eat that instead so um uh the, the article uh hypothesizes or not hypothesizes, but presents that in many ways that agriculture was a catastrophe leading to social, sexual inequality, disease, despotism that currently plague our existence now. And um, within the article itself that he wrote, Jared Diamond discusses that prior to agriculture, right? Everybody was kind of in the same boat that we're all hungry. And so we all need to band together to be close and try and hunt down this animal, whichever way. But then once farming comes into play, now people who have their own sections of land who happen to be the most fertile parts of land can now say, hey, this is my land and you can work for me to help and I'll give you a little bit or like they can kind of section off their own area and now they have all the food and then while their compatriots don't have any food and they kind of have to go out and hunt or whatever leading and again so they use this to kind of lead this into indentured like servants or a servant kind of like a feudalism type thing where because this guy was ha was lucky enough to have the fertile part of the area that now he can control it as he pleases he can distribute food if he wants to or he can just keep it to himself and make everybody else have to starve or whatever same thing 
talking about sexual inequality that in some in different cultures, I believe which culture did he say that it was? That um that in New Guinea, granted this article was written uh, about 20, 30 years ago, in New Guinea he talks about how women were the ones who had to stagger under loads of vegetables and firewood while men walked in empty-handed and made them do all the heavy lifting while they themselves did nothing. So, nothing in the article and within what he wrote seems to contradict that. Um, you can even say that even today, with all the government, um, I guess, not the government subsidies to the corn industry, how corn syrup is placed in everything, um, that something similar kind of holds true to today. And now, the most interesting thing, though, that I thought was um, height differences. And so he brings this up on page 23 of the Current World Code, talking about uh, the article. The article that he references is Major Correlates of Male Height, a study of 105 countries by Grass Gruber in 2016. And in taller nations, the consumption of plant proteins markedly decreased at the expense of animal proteins, especially those from dairy. And the highest consumption rates can be found in Northern and Central Europe, but the global peak of male height in the Neanderthals uh, at 184 centimeters. And talking about how skeletons from Greece and Turkey, uh, so this is from the book, Skeletons from Greece and Turkey reveal that 12,000 years ago, the average height of hunter-gatherers was 5 feet 9 inches for men and 5 feet and 5 foot 5 for women, and the adoption of agriculture, adult height plummeted. And this is also referenced in that earlier Discover magazine article talking about how we, with the adoption of agriculture, we have traded quantity for quality. So animal foods, animal source foods being the more quality source foods and plant foods just being the more quantity. We can just shove, again, right? You can shove one potato into the ground and get continue to get multiple potatoes over the course of weeks, months, so on and so forth. And so in the article that he references, I'll say it again, major correlates of male height, a study in 105 countries, that there are three, the, the article brings up three distinct nutritional styles. So the nutritional style in tropical Asia, Asia is based on rice and characterized by low consumptions of protein and energy, which is accompanied by small statures between 162 and 168 centimeters. Second countries, and such as the ones in North Africa, in Muslim countries is based on wheat and the consumption of plant protein reaches the highest values in the world. The intake of protein and total energy is relatively high as well and comparable with Europe, but the average height of young males is still rather short and doesn't exceed 174 centimeters. Now, the final one is based on animal proteins, particularly from dairy. So people in Northern Central Europe, the Netherlands, all, the, all those places, and the regions characterized so like or people form like where half Thor Bjornsson is from is that the region character characterized by the tallest statues in the world of greater than 180 centimeters only being matched by people of the Western Balkans they say which have they have some extraordinary genetic predispositions meaning they're just they're naturally just freakishly tall as opposed to eating animal proteins that help to facilitate their growth um, it also says that most importantly, our results indicate that plant-based diets are not able to provide optimal stimuli for physical growth, even if the intake of total protein and energy poses no problem. And that there is a difference of 10 centimeters between nations relying on a surplus of plant and animal proteins and a low consumption of proteins that correlate highly with height can 
explain the seemingly perplexing small statue in the developed countries of East Asia and Muslim oil superpowers. So it seems that even if you can eat as many plants, at least this article, this journal article is saying that even if you can eat as many plants as you want, it's still not going to be, again, it becomes a quality versus quantity matchup. And then even apparently with equal intakes of, so if you had an equal intake of plant proteins and plant nutrition and diet, it's still not going to rival. And so if you had an equal amount of animal sourced proteins and foods, it seems that the animal protein sources and foods will lead to increased height and overall better physical development for younger uh, humans. So that concludes the first section of the Carnivore Co. Dissection for chapters one and two. I hope that y'all like this kind of content. I figured I'd try something a little bit different. And um, I specifically wanted to do this because everyone's always talking about diets, everyone says, and this isn't to bash people who are on the carnivore diet. If you're on the carnivore diet and it's working for you, great, I'm happy for you, fantastic. Uh, and this also isn't to try and like um, prove vegans wrong or say that, hey, your vegan diet is stupid. Again, this is mostly for my own uh, scientific curiosity and just looking at the different diets, seeing what seems, and again, so like if a vegan diet's working for you, great, fine, I don't care, good luck with that. Again, any diet, keto diet, whatever diet, except the Western diet, if you're eating a typical Western diet, well, you need to change that right now because that ain't working and that isn't gonna help you with anything. But if you're eating an actual healthy diet that's leading you to your goals, by all means, you know, continue to do so. Don't let, just because one person says one thing or that one person says another to make you feel like you're wrong unless it's a typical Western diet, in which case you are wrong. <clears throat> Finally, um, if, if there's another book, if there's another kind of diet book that interests y'all or that you've read and you kind of want me to do another sort of dissection similar to this, please let me know down in the comments below. Or if you do have this book and you think I maybe glossed over something that should have been talked about in the in this part, by all means, again, let me know. I'd love to talk about it or I'll even just bring it up in the next video. Hope y'all have a great day. Stay safe. Stop tricking. Peace.